changes, adding it to plants. And now we're at an age that not only can we manipulate, we can build. So we can almost create DNA Lego pieces, put them together to form something new. Now, this sounds super exciting, but that it has consequences. And our next speaker is currently doing her PhD on molecular biology. Uh, she is part, uh, she's been a, a lot of times part of the iGEM competition, international competition on, uh, on, on the biology and biotechnology. And she will share her vision on um, synthetic biology, the building blocks in DNA, and much more. Please welcome on the stage, Renske. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, yeah, like you already introduced me, so I won't say too much about that. I will talk about hacking life. So using biology in such a way that you cannot just only look at it, but also make stuff out of it. Well, my name is Renske, but I'm also here on behalf of iGEM Groningen. iGEM, I will talk about that later, what that is, what it means, and uh, why this is such an exciting thing. Um, Firstly, a little bit about myself, uh, so you understand why I stand on this stage. Uh, I did a master and bachelor in molecular biology in Groningen, and when I was there, uh, after a while, uh, I got more and more interested in this thought of how you can build with life. So I joined IGEM in 2012, which is a competition, and more will come later. And I was quite excited about that, I, I really liked uh, uh, doing what we did there. So I stayed in Groningen, and now I'm a PhD candidate there, working on uh, bugs which cause uh, infections in your lung and in your, your brain. They are called streptococcus pneumonia. And we're also using these synthetic biological tools to try to figure out how they work and also to maybe combat them in a certain way. Well, I'll leave that at this moment to uh, decide, but if you have any questions about it, of course, afterwards you can ask me uh, if you're interested. What I talk about now this time is the journey of synthetic biology and what, why this stuff is so interesting. So firstly, as a biologist, that's how I started. Uh, you think about life and you mostly see then uh, animals and things uh, flying around like this butterfly I put here on the slide. Um, but if you then start to study biology and st study this in more depth, it starts mostly more to look like this. So there's all kinds of stuff. This is, by the way, uh, a picture from uh, a bacterium. And then they try to depict all kinds of stuff which is happening around the DNA in this bacterium. And you see it's quite a mess. It's a lot. And it starts to be a bit confusing also for us because uh, one thing influences the other, the other thing influences the other, and then it's connected, and then something else happens, and it's one big, big network. And that's why we try to simplify these things and write them down as this. So we have a gene which is maybe influenced by the next gene. Then we have another gene which influ and another, and they influence each other, so they kind of uh, work together. Then you have some others which are maybe connected in three different ways, and then you get really big written down networks. And I imagine synthetic biology, I'm not really sure if this is really how it exactly happened, but this is how I imagine how this started. That at one moment, these molecular biologists were looking at their gene networks, and then a physicist might have come into the lab, or a programmer. And he would have uh, looked over the shoulder, looked at these type of networks, and then thought, hey, that looks kind of like electronic circuits. Uh, why don't we write these things down in the same way? And that's what they started to do. So instead of writing down these uh, curved arrows we, uh, we, we like and uh, this is biologi biological way of uh, thinking, now the thinking starts to change and we don't think in a way a programmer would think. So uh, a gene which influences another gene positively might, uh, might and then maybe uh, the other one influences the other one positively, that looks like uh, maybe an end gate or an or NOR gate. So they started really to, to, write, to make these circuits the same way as you can do in electronic circuits. And that's where uh, synthetic biology really, really started. So just to summarize that, you have the engineering part and you have bioengineering, which are the toolbox of the biologist. And then when you put those two together, you get synthetic biology. So this all happened uh, quite some years ago, 
And uh, now the tools are getting better and better and better. And also this way of thinking is getting more and more in people's head. It gets more interdisciplinary. Uh, and now we really have this verge of what I could call at least the synthetic biology revolution. Um, so when we start here, let's put the timeline. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, this was one of the things which happened at that time was the Human Genome Project. Uh, people uh, took a year or 10 to try to sequence the whole ge genome of one uh, person. Uh, when that, uh, that, that took uh, 10 years and then they could sequence the whole genome. They knew exactly what was in, in their genes. And also uh, around 2004, the first uh, iGEM competition was uh, done in, uh, in, at MIT in Boston in the US. So that was the first time that people uh, started to uh, use synthetic biology and, and, and look at it uh, with some students. Then after that, uh, the first synthetic biology drug uh, was uh, developed, which is ertomycinin, it's an anti-malarial drug. And that was quite a revolution because this was one of the first times that they could manage to reshape a whole metabolic circuit and put it into a yeast cell instead of a plant cell to make this new drug. And they really used computer programming to plan which uh, part of the genetic circuit they had to change, you know, to rewire. So this was quite new. The sad story about this is that it's not really on the market because of some more marketing and society issues. So, uh, but it is made and, and technologically it works. So, uh, after that, uh, you also could get, uh, I don't know if anybody has known, uh, knows Greg Fenter, but what he did was uh, put uh, the uh, completely synthesized uh, genome inside a new organism. So he had the first synthetically uh, made gen uh, genome having organism. And the people who made that, they also put, uh, just as a joke, the coordinates of their addresses uh, in, the, in the DNA and put it in there, just because they could. And then a lot of stuff happens. That's where we are now. We're now 2016 and uh, we have to zoom in now to see, uh, I will tell, tell you three different uh, major events which happened uh, in the last uh, era, which really, really will change the way we think about biology. So this synthetic biology revolution, there we are. So the first one is the revolution of the do-it-yourselfer. And that's where I will start uh, with iGEM. So this is um, the summary of how iGEM has started. They thought that synthetic biology should be so modular, so easily adjustable, that any undergraduate student, so a 19-year-old student from any type of uh, background, doesn't have to be a biologist, should be able to build a biological machine over the course of a summer. So this is how iGEM started in 2004. Uh, what they did, they designed a way to put this biological uh, important things, so the genes and the regulators of the genes, into parts. So there are still the genes, but uh, now they put them in such a way that it was easy to cut and paste them and put them together, and to reshape them, put them in different orders, and in that way, uh, make it easy to, uh, to understand what, what would happen and to put it into a new organism. And the nice thing is that they, except for making these parts, uh, they also put it into a big category, which you can look up online if you want. It's parts.igem.org. Uh, but, uh, and uh, there you can see which ones are available. You can uh, order them, you can share them with each other. And in that way, you have some kind of uh, a repository of uh, biological functions, which you can mix and match and put together into uh, new biological functions. So then, of course, after that, you would start building. So I will tell you the story about when I started iGEM. I was, it was in 2012. I was uh, a student uh, first year in my master. And we also wanted to start building with, uh, with these biological parts. So then the first question, of course, is what do you want to make? Well, we decided that we were interested in uh, food because food is wasted quite often. And uh, one of the reasons is that the best by date of food mostly is not specific. So after a while, when you are uh, storing your food in the fridge, you, the, the date might say you, you have to throw it away, but maybe you can actually keep it for a few days longer. And that finally makes up one third of the food in the world is actually thrown away. So we were wondering if you then uh, 
can have another way to detect whether your food is still safe, whether it's spoiled or not, then maybe we can uh, uh, make this a bit better. So we decided to uh, uh, make a bacterium which can smell whether your meat is rotten or not. So that was our de decision to, to try to make. And what we did for that is that we took uh, a bacterium we knew quite well, uh, one which lives in the soil, and we knew that that one is quite often around different other bacteria. So maybe that one can sense other bacteria, and of course also the source of food spoilage is mostly also other bacteria. So what we did, we put that bacterium we wanted to, to use uh, uh, next to uh, rotten meat, literally, uh, and we put those two things together for a few hours. Then we isolated the RNA, which is the active genes in, uh, in the bacterium. So we isolated that and then read that out through, uh, well, we sent it to a company and they could read out which, which one uh, are okay. And, that, well, and when that happens, uh, we got back one big hit. So one gene was super active when it was next to the rotten meat. What we then did was uh, take this super active gene, put it behind, behind it, we put a, a gene for a yellow color, and then at that moment, we could put the bacteria in a bag next to the rotten meat, and as soon as the, uh, the, the meat uh, volatiles came next to the bacteria, the bacteria became yellow. Well, it took four hours, I have to tell you that, but uh, still uh, we were able to make a, a rotten meat sensing bacteria. Uh, with that, we went to Boston, and uh, well, you can see here we won this uh, big Lego brick uh, uh, there. It was uh, quite nice. Um, but also the cool thing is that we, were, we just needed one gene uh, to sense this bacteria, and we just needed one gene to get the color, and that was all to be able to make an, a new function. So that is the DIY of students, but it's still all in a, uh, in a university. And it is also, of course, it would be cooler uh, if it's not only the people in the university who can do this, but maybe also people at home. That's at least what some people thought. So uh, what happens now is that you have a lot of people who are building microscope out of their smartphones. They are uh, making DNA amplifiers uh, at home uh, with stuff you can just buy at a, at, a, at a store where you can normally buy things to build your things in your house. And also, uh, sterile spaces uh, can be made with the use of a vacuum cleaner and some plexiglass. You can find uh, the manuals for this online very easily, and then you can do it yourself. And that's what starts now. So you don't only have these students who make this stuff, you only don't only have researchers who build their bacteria, but you have a group of people who call themselves biohackers or DOI bios, and they now build, uh, build stuff with genes and with bacteria in their own garage. Uh, iGEM also kind of recognizes that. So from a few, few years since now, also teams which are non-students can join. And uh, that uh, led to last year or two years ago, I was uh, in Boston and then I met the guys from this team. Uh, it's a group of uh, hippies from San Francisco and they made uh, vegan cheese uh, f with the genes from narwhals. So they made vegan narwhal cheese. It's very expensive still and it can only make like little cubes but it's starting these things, and they really do it at, at home. They have a license, I have to tell you, but they, they do this stuff. I, and you can also see it's people uh, from all ages, and they just come together to make these things. So pretty cool. Uh, then uh, the next part of this revolution, and now it's getting a bit more complicated. Um, that is the revolution of CRISPR-Cas. I don't know if anybody heard, here heard of CRISPR-Cas before, but it's a big thing in biology at the moment. And I will try to guide you through it a little bit. So what you see here is a bacterium, and uh, the bacterium has a virus. So that's the first lesson maybe here. Also bacteria get sick. They get infected with viruses. Uh, and then of course uh, the virus, what the virus does, it injects its DNA into the bacterium. So, so the bacterium will make the virus DNA and then the virus will make more and more of it until the bacterium dies. So this bacterium has a problem. But luckily, this bacterium also has a solution. And the solution is its immune system. So that's maybe also news for you. Bacteria don't only get sick, they also have an immune system. Uh, what it does, this immune system, it recognizes the virus DNA and cuts it in pieces. And in that way, finally, the bacterium is free of the viral DNA and it can live again. So that's, and that immune system, that name is CRISPR-Cas. So 
the only, what the virus not only does, because now it's better again, it keeps a little piece of this viral DNA in its DNA, and in that way, it has a piece of memory, so it remembers this virus. So the next time it comes by, it cuts it into pieces much faster, just like our own uh, immune system also recognizes parts of viruses we get, and that's how, for instance, vaccines work. Well, bacteria also have this type of system. This was research already for a couple of years, like maybe 10 or 15 or so. But then about four or three years ago, a guy or a girl, I even don't know who, but somebody uh, uh, had this brilliant idea that you cannot only uh, investigate it and look at how cool these bacteria are, because I mean, they, they, they are pretty smart, uh, but you can also use this uh, CRISPR-Cas system. So they redesigned this system and then they redesign it in such a way that you can specifically cut any piece of DNA you want. And in this way, when you specifically cut this DNA, you can also, if it's open, introduce new DNA between the genome. And this is a big revolution. What happened now is that there is a new way to introduce new genes into the system without uh, the tedious uh, systems we had before. Normally, you had to introduce uh, uh, round pieces of DNA, uh, use uh, bacteria, uh, uh, viruses to, to put stuff into, into the genome. But now this stuff enables people to uh, en uh, engineer the DNA of plants or even humans in a, in a week or so. So it's, this is uh, quite revolutionary and also a bit scary in some way because for instance, last year, uh, the first uh, uh, trial in the UK started with using this technique on embryos. So, if, uh, so this is already happening, so they're already researching these things. So this uh, leads me to the last part, so the last part of what I think are important things in the synthetic biology revolution, and that is uh, the revolution of DNA itself. So. At this moment, sequencing and synthesis of DNA is cheaper, better, so more trustworthy and faster than ever, but it's still in this exponential phase. So soon, this stuff will be very easy to send your own uh, a sample to a company and then maybe for about 1,000 euros in a, in a week, you will get your own sequence back and you know exactly what's in, in your DNA. Uh, and also, this enab enables new techniques and novel uh, ways of using DNA. So one of the things is uh, using DNA as data storage, for instance. That's uh, something Microsoft is researching at the moment. So they're experimenting uh, with DNA data storage because it's very stable and it stays there for a long time. And it's, uh, um, yeah, so that's interesting for a lot of companies to see whether that works. And then of course also, uh, can you then also, the question is then also, can you use this biology to, uh, use novel ways of data encryption. And that's something maybe some people already uh, heard uh, the workshop this afternoon of the iGEM team of this year, which I'm supervising. Uh, so there is a, a group of uh, students in Groningen which are trying to work around different ways you can use biology to encrypt and keep your data safe. And the other way around, of course, there were probably also maybe are then ways biologically to hack your data, which is probably again a, a different story. Well, if I wrap all these things up, uh, there is a lot of new things going on and a lot of uh, uh, techniques which might change the world in, in a certain way. So finally, with all these new technologies, I think there is also some new responsibility, not only for the researcher, but also for society. Uh, we have to think about what we want and what we don't want, what's, uh, what we can and what we cannot do. Uh, and these are questions I don't have my own answer to for you, but I just want to ask you to think about these things. Like where, where, where does it end, where does it, or where do you want to go? Um, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And please, uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, have any questions or want to start a discussion, uh, that would be cool. So, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Questions? See one over there? Hi, I'm a medical student from London. And I was wondering, like, how would you regulate this? Because there's a startup from University College London, my university, called Bento Lab. 
where you can manipulate DNA with equipment costing less than 50 pounds, so like 60 or 70 euros. Yeah. And with that, I could potentially create a pathogen if I so felt like it. What would you do with this kind of open source DNA manipulation? I think this is a very, very good question because finally, um, so the, yeah, so the question is, if we all have all this knowledge and it's all open source, how can we regulate still and keep, keep things uh, safe? Um, and I, I, I'm actually not really sure how to do that except for monitoring stuff so that you still at least know what's happening. And also a bit having a bit of safety in my head that uh, it's not that easy to do all, all these things. So probably it will take a while. And you still need to order a certain amount of stuff just as if you want to build a bomb, you have to order a cert certain amount of chemicals here also you need specific things, so it probably is not completely undetectable <laughs> if people do these things. But other, other than that, I don't know. No. Other questions? I have a question. Can you, uh, in a simple way, explain how they are, the Microsoft experiment, how they're storing data? What kind of devices do they need? Um, I actually, I'm not really sure. They, they, because they are now experimenting. They're trying different things. Uh, so they, they don't store the DNA inside a living organism. So they just order a lot of synthesized DNA, which is synthesized in a, in a machine. And then uh, they store it, uh, well, DNA can be just stored in, in room temperature and it stays stable. So I think they, they are thinking of uh, trying different ways to, to make the DNA and to, to store it maybe at different, in different manners to see how stable it really is. But I'm not really sure. Uh, what they exactly do it's with it. It's not like they have like a hard disk printer or they're printing no. patterns. I'm not sure. Yes, yeah. still in the making. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, we'd like to thank you very much. We have a gift for you. <laughs> so uh, let me get it real quick. There it is. One <laughs> uh, big round of applause, please. Thank you. And thank you very much for the talk. <laughs>